Hello, it's Scott Manley here. It's July 16th and we have had a wild couple of weeks in spaceflight, which uh, I'm going to recount in the latest Deep Space update, beginning, of course, with the various launches, many of which did not go as planned. But back on 29th of June, we had a launch from Vandenberg carrying 20 Star Shield satellites in the form of NROL 186. Now, this is the second of six missions built by Northrop Grumman and SpaceX, carrying a large constellation of optical reconnaissance satellites into orbit. So this is going to be basically the military version of something like Planet Labs, where they are essentially scanning the surface of the Earth with very high cadence. 29th of June in China, there was a Long March 7A uh, launching ChinaSat 3A into a geostationary transfer orbit. So yeah, this is a you know communication satellite and it used the largest configuration of the, the Long March 7A, which uses four strap-on liquid boosters to be able to launch this heavy satellite up into geostationary orbit. On the 30th of June, things start to get weird. There was um, supposed to be a static fire of the forthcoming Tian Long Boost 3 booster, which is pretty much a a Chinese version of SpaceX Falcon 9. It looks very, very, very similar. It was not as static as they anticipated. The hold down clamps failed. It has now come out that they had actually fully fueled the booster to make it as heavy as possible. It was only supposed to run for 30 seconds, but the engines actually shut down sooner after there were problems with one of the engines, which was presumably damaged on ascent. The vehicle uh, touchdown site formed a big fireball 1.5 kilometers away, right on the edge of the evacuation area. They were lucky they had an engine failure. If it had gone further, it could have gone outside that area. Also, they were very lucky it went south. If it had gone almost any other direction, it would have gone into potentially inhabited areas. So this investigation is ongoing. I'm sure we're not going to find out much more, but it was a pretty spectacular static fire. On the 1st of July, Japan performed the first operational mission of the H-3 rocket, the H-3-22S configuration carrying a spacecraft called ALOS-4 from Tanegashima. So this is the Advanced Land Observing Satellite number 4. It's also called Daiichi-4, which is you know Japanese word meaning a great land. So that's like a three-ton uh, L-band synthetic aperture radar satellite. And it's replacing a 10-year-old satellite called ALOS-2. 3rd of July, we had Falcon 9 launching 20 Starlinks in Group 8-9 from Florida. 4th of July, barely the 4th of July. It's technically the 3rd of July in California when it launched. It was just after like 9 o'clock Pacific time. But of course, that is after midnight on the East Coast. So it was July 4th and Firefly got the first and the biggest rocket of July 4th. You know the rocket's red glare? Well, we couldn't really see that much from California. Actually, I mean, we were able to see it from where I was. And just because of the angle it flew, it flew into like 137 degree inclination orbit, which meant it kind of went east over the Pacific. And it was basically going directly away from me, and I could track it for a very long time. Both, uh, you know, both objects, the booster and the second stage, remained within the frame of view. So this was carrying a bunch of, you know, cube satellites for, you know, U.S. universities. This is part of the Alana, the experimental launch of nano satellites, number forty-three in that program. Um, 8th of July, Falcon 9 launched Turksat 6A into geostationary transfer orbit. Uh, there have been eight previous Turksat communication satellites, but they were all built by other countries. And this is the first domestically produced Turkish geostationary communication satellite. This is an agreement that goes back 10 years uh, and they obviously spent a long time building it up and it's going to head to orbital slot 42 degrees east. It'll be able to cover Europe and Asia, even as far you know, west as the UK. Uh, 9th of July, we had the debut of Ariane 6 after many, many years, four years too late. This was a test launch that mainly carried cube satellites and other small payloads, including a pair of test re-entry capsules. And... Uh, Unfortunately, while this did make it to orbit, it had a problem with its uh, auxiliary propulsion unit, which failed at partway through the flight when it was supposed to relight the engine for the second time. That never happened. 
and therefore the stage never uh, got into its like re-entry orbit the re-entry capsules were never deployed and the spacecraft is now stuck in orbit so while Ariane 6 demonstrated that most of the stages work pretty well and it should be able to inject stuff into orbit pretty well um, it's not demonstrated its ability to do direct GEO injection so we're probably going to see some investigation on that front and at some point the stage may come down but it's pretty high up. 10th of July in China Hyperbola 1 built by uh, iSpace launching Yunyao 15 to 17. This is a four stage solid rocket bo booster based system and it failed on the fourth stage. This is the second upper stage failure right? Uh, so this is actually their fourth failure in seven launches and you know I would say they were like the Chinese version of Astra but uh, the record isn't that bad. And on the 12th of July we had Falcon 9 launching another batch of Starlink. Yeah I know just another batch of Starlink except this one failed. Wow what a news thing. I know you guys are all like stop talking about Starlink launches they're boring. No this one failed. 300 launches over 300 launches in a row and this one had an issue with its upper stage now actually all the three launch failures or maybe we've seen have been upper stage failures that's including amos 6 right um so yeah it looks like we had an oxygen leak in the engine and it got itself into its initial orbit but when it went to relight the engine the engine had an rud damaged the stage they dropped off the satellites into the or, you know, relatively low orbit. They were not able to make it into orbit. And so, yeah, the FAA says, uh-oh, yeah, we're going to have to investigate this. Or rather, SpaceX is going to have to investigate this. And you know, Falcon 9 isn't supposed to launch until FAA is satisfied that there's not a safety issue. And apparently today, SpaceX has submitted a preliminary um, report on the potential safety of Falcon 9 launches going forwards. So the FAA is going to look at this and honestly I think it's pretty likely that SpaceX is going to get back into the launch game because they can cite large number of statistics showing that the upper stage is broadly safe. I'm sure there's customers that may want to hold back a little more. We did expect that we would have um, Polaris Dawn coming at the end of this month. That may well be moved back a little. Uh, the investigation itself into actually what caused the problem may take a whole lot longer and yeah we're gonna have to wait to find out what happened there so yeah it's wild three upper stage failures in a row anyway going back uh to you know the actual news when i last released a video it was getting ready for asteroid day and the schweikert prize and i was there at chabot sitting on stage with nicole stott steve smith uh, Rusty Schweikart, all astronauts, and another astronomer known as Joseph De De Martino, who uh, won the prize, $10,000, for his suggestion on how you can use twilight time on telescopes to look for asteroids that are close to the sun that would otherwise be lost. So that's what the, you know, the Schweikart Prize is. It's a thing they're doing on Asteroid Day to basically reward people that are interested in coming up with new ways of protecting the Earth from killer asteroids. Moving onwards, um, on July 9th, we got the, the House Science Committee. They released their NASA Reauthorization Act for 2024. Um, so this is basically the spending bill that you know, NASA is going to expect to have next year. The bill would authorize something like 25 and a quarter billion dollars. It's a little less than what the administration asked for, a little more than what Congress suggests. But it's pretty much funding all the regular things. Notably in this, there, there's language that says, yeah, don't shut down Chandra until we've had another proper review of the you know, astrophysics division. And apparently Congress would like a report from NASA on other potential customers for SLS. And I'm going to say right now that is probably a very short report. Somebody suggested it would be a two word report with the second word being all. And I could think of many words that go for the first word, but that would be a first word problem, right? Uh, no, yeah, bugger all. Yeah, that sounds about right. Seriously, I don't think many uh, customers outside of NASA at this time, because it's largely a thing that's been fueled by political will rather than actual scientific will. Anyway, moving onwards and abroad. In Japan, they're getting in on the private space station game. There's a company 
that is a subsidiary of Mitsui called Japan LEO Shachu Incorporated. They're building or coming up with a way to potentially fund and sell a module for a space station. Presumably it will dock onto somebody else's space station and uh, it's going to you know, use all the technology they developed for HTV and Kibo. It'll have like a lab section, um, you know, a vacuum section. Um, so anyway, it's interesting that other countries are getting in on the commercial LEO destinations game. In less peaceful use of space, uh, it's worth mentioning that uh, the US Department of Defense is going to spend $140 billion on the Sentinel Intercontinental Ballistic Missile Program, which, yes, it's not really a rocket, but it does use your know, rocket thrusters and it does go into space. So I think it's worth mentioning. This is the successor to the Minuteman 3 and it's probably going to operate well. In, it's going to probably operate for 50 years past today. So we're talking like 2070s. Now, it's pretty expensive. It's something like $180 million per unit, which is expensive compared to like a rocket. But one thing to consider, one differentiator between missiles and uh, like rockets is for every missile, you need to build a silo and a launch facility because you need them to all launch at the same time. So a lot of the money building this is actually going into building the silos and the launch facilities and the command and control and stuff like that. Anyway, yeah, well, we've been seeing a bunch of that stuff starting to get tested out of Vandenberg, and I'm no, lo no doubt going to see a whole lot more. Also on the testing front, we've had uh, a lot of a lot of uh, small startup or smaller rocket companies showing off their engine tests. We've had Stoke Space on showing off their full flow, uh, full flow stage combustion methyl ox engine. We have Firefly sharing new footage of testing their Miranda engine at their Cedar Park test site uh, in Texas. Beautiful green flash to get that started. It's of course a tap-off cycle engine. And uh, then we have Rocket Lab showing the pre-burner starting on their Archimedes engine, which is a staged combustion cycle engine. And that means getting them started up is sometimes a bit more complicated than just turning it on. In Asia, Kazakhstan is going to join China's lunar International Lunar Research uh, Station, right? Their program. And that in itself isn't that interesting. There's a handful of countries that have joined this. Some of those countries have also joined the Artemis Accord. But it's interesting in the case of Kazakhstan because a lot of the language that was uh, bandied around during this ceremony was suggesting that China is potentially interested in launch sites at Baikonur because China obviously has a number of inland sites that it's still using and we have problems with you know stages landing on the ground. There's a bunch of rocket startups that would like to be able to launch rockets but they can't find a space to do it. Baikonur could potentially be that. Russia has been migrating its launches away from Kazakhstan to Plisetsk or, Vos or Vostoshny China potentially has a demand that might fill in on that. And maybe we might see some launches. I mean, after all, um, you know, the Soyuz launches from Baikonur and it hasn't been able to launch sufficient to as low inclination as it could because it has to avoid China. Maybe that might change at one point. Still, I don't see uh, cosmonauts flying from Baikonur to the China Chinese space station. Now, moving back to Texas, uh, over at Boca Chica, we had the first test firing of booster number 12 in anticipation of flight number five. It looks like it's successful. We've got some great footage out of that. The booster has now left the test stand and is moving elsewhere. Also, the Texas tank watchers have seen, uh, revealed some photos of a new nose cone design, presumably for Starship version two. And this will have the flaps moved slightly leeward that should help reduce the sort of impinging pressure of the plasma that, of course, penetrated into that hinge on flight four. Now, of course, there's a lot of other changes that are coming in, but that's uh, something that we are hoping to see. The other Texas SpaceX thing is that today Elon announced that SpaceX is officially moving its headquarters from Hawthorne, California to Texas. Now, he, of course, you know, said it was because of political things, but look, this has been on the in the books since uh, February when they announced that they were actually moving their articles of incorporation from Delaware to Texas. So this is something that we have been expecting to happen. And uh, yeah, it's not surprising this is going to happen. Now, of course, they're not literally 
taking the Hawthorne factory and just shipping everything out to Texas. No, they're going to keep manufacturing Falcon 9 there, Merlin engine. What they are doing potentially is just moving the, na the company name only. They may start sign you know, standing up some executives, some design, things like that. After all, they're doing a lot of work down in Texas and it kind of makes sense to have their stuff close to there. In New Zealand, Dawn Aerospace has announced that it has received approvals from the New Zealand Civil Aviation Authority that will allow them to fly their Mark II Aurora test space plane to altitudes of up to 80,000 feet and unlimited speed. So they are going to start working towards their test flight. They're going to gain higher and higher altitudes, demonstrate that they can maintain uh, controllability. They're going to go supersonic and also, as well as getting speed and altitude, they're going to demonstrate rapid reusability so they can return to the landing site, refuel and go again, hopefully more than once a day. And I am looking forward to that because space planes are cool and awesome. On the moon in the sea of tranquility, published in Nature this week, evidence of caves in the moon, the caves off the moon, which uh, has come from old lunar reconnaissance orbiter data. So yes, for a long time we've seen visual evidence of these pits on the moon that look dark. We've been able to see slightly different illumination angles, but nobody has been able to see if there is caves that actually lead away from these. It's believed these are like collapsed lava tubes and that would imply there's uh, like passages leading off to the site. Well, a group, I believe in Italy, went and they dug through and they found some synthetic aperture radar data from 2010, which hadn't been analysed, or rather had been analysed, but it had been assumed that it was working with a flat surface. Now, the features around this were somewhat anomalous, and the thing with synthetic aperture radar data is you kind of have to assume the sort of source geometry. So they took that data and they started building models for what the cave could be like and seeing how that matched to the radar reflection. So they have a number of candidates that all seem to imply that the crater or this tube is like you know, 150 meters deep and then there's tunnels that lead off to the side. That's the evidence. So that's really cool because that is a potential place to actually put a long-term moon base where you could guarantee that the crew would be well shielded from potential cosmic radiation. So look, the moon is looking a little more habitable. Having said that, it's not a trivial thing to get a base down into a you know cavity, cavity that deep and then clean out the boulders and set up there. But still, you know, uh, it's a lot easier than digging giant holes. And finally, finally, JPL has sent hip hop to space. Okay, so not really. They have transmitted uh, the song The Rain Super Duper Fly, you know, Missy Misdemeanor Elliot to Venus. I guess they were testing the system and they thought it would be cute, so they asked Missy where she would want her songs, her tunes, her lyrics sent. And uh, she wanted Venus because I guess that's the goddess of love. Uh, so yeah, first hip-hop tune in space, she got her freak on, right? And that is the end of the news. And I guess in the next uh, few weeks, I'm hoping that we will get official return time for Starliner. Still not coming home. And actually, I was going to point out with, you know, SpaceX still questionable as to whether they can return to flight. It's not entirely possible, uh, it's not entirely unexpected if they decide to extend Starliner longer because the batteries, as I've heard, seem to be operating just fine. And if you're going to have to delay future Dragon flights, it might make sense to keep them around. But I fully expect that we will be seeing a return of Starliner before the next episode, this time for sure. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.